Hi, I'm Tom Dean. I'm a field engineer with Buoyant, and we are the creators of Linkerd Service Mesh, and Phil Henderson is here with me. This is our first time presenting. Please be gentle with us. And uh, you know, right now we're scared out of our wits, but we'll be okay. Uh, show of hands, uh, how many people here in the audience are Service Mesh users? Cool. Linkerd users? Few? Cool. How many people run in a multi-AZ setup right now and with their clusters? How many people are paying a lot of money for cross-AZ traffic? That's what I expected, right? So today we're here to talk a little bit about cross-AZ traffic and really focus on kind of, you know, what, what the impact of that is and, and uh, how you can leverage topology-aware routing to avoid that and, you know, how you can use a service mesh to kind of keep an eye on what topology-aware routing does and understanding, understand what's happening in your cluster and, you know, address certain scenarios. This is based on a blog post that I worked on with William, our CEO. If you'd like to go ahead and uh, dig down and read that, you can scan this QR code or you can go up to boyandi.io and look for the blog section and it's in there. It's pretty recent, a couple of months back. It shouldn't be hard to find. So it digs in. We did a little bit of research, wrote this up and uh, talked about you know, some ways to, to mitigate it. So before we start, reliability is the first duty, right? And this is why we're using service meshes generally it's going to give us security. That's with us, you know, our experience has been MTLS is the gateway drug for most people when it's, we're talking service meshes. They want to mesh, they want to get encryption in flight, you know, they want to make sure that their traffic is, is secure. But the, another big thing for customers is observability. You can consider observability and metrics kind of the same thing, but they are, but they're not. There's a lot of overlap. And the reason that's important, and it's important in this talk, is that we want to know what's going on with topology-aware routing and with our traffic in general, so that if we witness a condition that's strange, or maybe we don't witness it at all, we need something to tell us, hey, something's hinky here. We really need to kind of look and see what's going on. Performance is another advantage. You know, topology-aware routing is great, but when you put Linkerd in the mix, we're going to get this power of two choices, load balancing, and I'm not gonna go deep into it, but we look at two endpoints, we pick the more optimal endpoint. So even with topology aware routing and everything else, we're gonna pick one that is more favorable, so you're gonna get a bit of a performance boost and things are gonna be a little more smooth with regard to traffic and latency. Keeping traffic in zone. So what are failure domains? There's three big failure domains we wanna talk about. The first one is your cloud provider or you know on-prem, whatever, you wanna consider that whole thing that's kind of the most global, you know, you, using topology or routing is not going to fix that. If your cloud provider goes down, we, you know, that's not gonna prevent anything. The second is regions. Again, we're not talking about regions. That's something you have to consider kind of outside of the cluster. But the one we care about is the zone or the availability zone. Kubernetes knows about that. There's a, you know, a uh, label on your uh, nodes that tells it this is where I am, this is my zone, maybe US East 1, A, it could be you know, something that you put in if you're running on-prem. So that's what we're focusing on is, is the zone or the availability zone. And generally, like if you're running, say, EKS, you're probably gonna spread across three of those. And like we said, when you start to run traffic across zones, there's a cost associated with that, with, you know, and we're gonna talk about that here in a second. So how much does it cost, right? If you take an example of an EKS cluster in three AWS availability zones, these are the numbers. So if you've got a you know, measly 1K, you're like 40 cents per year, who cares? We don't need to worry about this. But if you're you know, a common customer that we see, one gig is a second per average, that's 410,000 per year. You know, do the math, divide that by months, you know, that's almost $40,000 a month. And that's considerable, plus the cost of latency. Anytime you jump, between data centers or between zones, you're gonna have a latency cost. So, you know, if you can keep it in zone whenever possible, that's gonna give you a little bit of a performance advantage. And like I said, again, then using Linkerd, you get that power of two choices, load balancing, that's gonna also give you a bit of a boost too. So what is topology aware routing? It used to be called topology hints, right? It's been around for a bit, part of Kubernetes. It is a way of doing connection-based routing, connection routing to tie your clients in one zone to your resources, you know, endpoints in, a, in that zone. So we keep traffic, it's hardwired at the kube proxy, and you know, it's a very straightforward way to keep things 
you, you know, enabling it is literally an annotation. Disabling it is removing that annotation. Pretty quick and easy to use. So what are the pros? It's a feature of Kubernetes. Nothing to install, nothing to activate. It's you know, mainstream enough now that you don't have to go and, and enable anything. It's, you just put that annotation on and you're ready to go. Another pro, keeps traffic in the AZ, right? So that has some uh, cost and latency advantages. And cons, you're gonna need at least three endpoints per zone. So you need to definitely consider that when you are uh, designing and implementing your services. The more endpoints you can have per zone, the better, you know, to a point, right, obviously. But running with the least amount of endpoints will bring you in and out of topology aware routing if you lose just one endpoint, right? So you wanna try and have some extra endpoints so that if you lose an endpoint, it's not gonna kick you out. Uh, topology aware routing is not aware of in-band uh, failures or problems like HTTP 500s and whatnot. So we're gonna show you, it's gonna keep just doing what it does because it doesn't know that, um, that those are happening. And it oh, sorry. kind of interacts poorly with features like HPA. We're not gonna demonstrate that here, but if you, know, if you wanna look into that, you wanna play with that yourself, you'll see that it, it really requires kind of a stable state. You need to consider your traffic and your design so that you've got things spread somewhat evenly, right? It's not very dynamic. It's connection-based routing, not request-based routing, right? So it doesn't adapt with each request. It really is just hardwiring your service, you know, requesters to your endpoints and your services in the back end. So how does topology aware routing work? This is straight out of the blog. I sh shamelessly poached it. Like we said, Kubernetes feature designed to address the cross AZ problem. It basically takes it at the network level at Kube Proxy and it hardwires those connections together and says, look, these are the endpoints you're gonna use. Your requester, your client, you're in this zone. These are your endpoints. How does it interact with Linkerd? Linkerd's destination controller respects that. So when we are choosing endpoints, we will defer to topology aware routing as long as it's enabled. So we don't try and do anything, right? And we're gonna show like what is what does it look like with just Linkerd when we add topology aware routing, what happens in certain scenarios? So let's talk about this kind of covers our application that we've got and it covers how it works. But right now we've got a application that has three orders, deployments, in, you know, one in each zone, and we've got three warehouse services and we have one in each zone. We've got three replicas of each. So we've got nine total clients, nine total endpoints for the service. And right now, without topology or routing, everything talks to everything. So if you think about that, for each client, a third of the requests are staying in zone. Two thirds are going out of zone. So, you know, you would basically, two thirds of your traffic for each client is going to cost you money if you're paying to run that traffic across zones. When we enable topology or routing, we hardwire those connections. We've got connection-based routing. Traffic stays in zone, pretty straightforward. If you've got things balanced, it works really great. Health check. So I talked about this a little earlier, in-band versus out-of-band. So in-band health checks, Kubernetes is not aware of these, right? So because Kubernetes is not aware of your in-band health checks, it is not going to respond if all of a sudden we're getting HTTP 500s. It doesn't know. It's like, okay, all the endpoints are up. We're good. Let's keep sending traffic. Traffic is flowing. You know, it thinks everything's great because it's only paying attention to, do we have enough endpoints? You know, are they reachable, right? Out of band. This is where a service mesh is going to help and, you know, where you start to talk about things like request-based routing. It's going to be looking at things at that layer seven. And if it detects something, that's you know, a miss, it's going to say, oh, oh, I better do something about that. But with connection-based routing, it doesn't know that. It just knows, are my endpoints up? Do I have enough endpoints in each zone? If it doesn't, it's going to disable itself. All right, I've talked enough. I wanted to hustle through the slides because I know all of you are betting on whether our demo is gonna fail and you wanna get to the action, right? So we're gonna walk through a demo. I'm gonna show, we're gonna show three scenarios where you know, we have some failure modes and you know, in-band and out-of-band, and let's see how Linkerd handles it initially, and then let's see when we enable topology or routing, you know, what the results are there. I'm not here to bag on topology or routing, I'm just talking about one of the bigger things is you know, why observability is important, right? 
because it's it's a pretty straightforward feature that you know you kind of got to keep an eye on because if things go you know amiss then you might need to understand what's happening to fix it all right everyone say a little okay. pr prayer to the demo guys before this uh <laughs> talk i was struggling with my macbook as throttling all my pods so let's just all see right. everything goes well first scenario is latency so what happens when we inject like 600 milliseconds of additional latency into our application we'll go through metrics first Oh, you go, oh, yeah, metrics. Sorry, we're we going to talk about metrics, metrics and why it's important. Just give you an overview of metrics and what they look like and what how we can use them as uh, observability tools. So, um, first, we're going to look at um, all of our metrics that are available. As you can see, there is a lot of them available. This is for the three pods and one of our deployments. Obviously, no one's going to go and read through all these. I I couldn't even tell you how many of them I actually know here off the top of my head. If we look at how many there are there's almost 2,000 unique metrics for those three pods. That's a lot of metrics. That's hard to go through. Yeah, that's a single zone. A single zone. But with Linkerd Viz, we can view those things in a nice, easy format. We can get our success rates, our requests per seconds, and all of our latencies that we would want to know, our golden metrics, as they call them. And it also kind of has it based on routes. So you can get your probe routes and your default routes, which could be important for people who want to make sure that they're not looking at their probe metrics when trying to do their, their business logic. Now, additionally there, you could define HTTP routes and split the stuff in the default out so you could observe traffic to specific um, services or service um, services that are available, but we're just kind of keeping it simple, right? All the traffic's in one big default bucket. Yeah, and we can still use Linkerd to start getting um, stat outbound on our deployment and see how that traffic is going. And we can still get, again, our success rate, request per second, and all of our golden metrics that we like for latency. And, you know, it's nice when you can use a little grep and, like, get some of that information out of there, right? A little grep magic always helps our lives, right? Who in here knows Linux a little bit, right? All right, and you can see that we have all of our endpoints. As Tom was talking about, we have nine endpoints for topology aware routing that we are required to have. Yeah, it's important to note that, right? You want to understand how many endpoints do I have? Are they healthy? And so we have some commands that, you know, and some stuff. You can also leverage kubectl. There's some good commands we're going to show here. But understanding what the status of your endpoints and where they are is pretty important, you know, when you're using connection-based routing. And I'm someone who loves the command line, just how I've always been. But, you know, sometimes it's easier just to go to Grafana, right? We all have used Grafana. Most of us have or some other uh, visualization tool. And we can easily see our, our statistics here. A little yeah. larger for everyone. So we have a dashboard. I use this a lot because I'm kind of the, the zonal guy, right? And uh, so the three panels that are kind of important at the top, we've got a in zone, out of zone. That's your green and, and red lines up there. And it, it'll tell us where the traffic is. And right now, what is it? In zone, same AZ is red and, or no, cross AZ is red and mm -hmm. same AZ is green. Uh, underneath that, we have success rate. That's important. We want to make sure that our service is successful and that our traffic is getting where it needs to go and it's coming back. And then there's latency to the right of that. And latency is pretty important because, you know, obviously we want to see that we're not, you know, struggling with regards to latency in one zone or any particular zone. Sorry, fam. So that was demo one. Now we're going to go into some scenarios. All right. Now, I'm not going to jump the gun. In the first scenario, we want to take a look at the effect of latency. And we're going to inject 600 milliseconds into a single zone. It's the west zone. So that comprises our west orders and our Oakland warehouse. So we injected our latency. So 600 milliseconds for the warehouse. And we can still see that we have all of our endpoints, all nine endpoints. We can still see our statistics. Everything is at 100% success rate, and we can see that, you know, we're seeing our latency being load balanced across all three of our warehouses. Yeah, remember, two, three. We've got three requesters, three warehouses. So right now, everything's talking to everything. So latency is only impacting a third of the requests for each client. And to add a topology aware routing, it's as easy as adding an annotation to your services, and it's there. And you can check it by, you know, just, you know, getting a git grep for your annotation. You can see that it's there. It's on auto. And you can also see it in events, which is nice and helpful if you like to look at events. 
One thing to note is sometimes, especially when it falls out, it might not show up in events immediately. It can take a while. So again, having additional ways to measure success or to measure impacts is pretty important. Again, that's why observability and metrics are kind of key when you want to use topology aware routing. And again, we still have all nine of our endpoints. It's all about the endpoints. Yep, connection-based routing, you know, as long as we've got enough endpoints, it's going to be happy. So what does our deployment in the West look like? We can use Linkerd Viz to, again, see all of our statistics of success rates, requests per seconds, and of all of our latencies. And you can see everything's kind of uh, being now to that one zone. Yeah, it's if you got all the latency around. contained to one zone, you know, someone might ask, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. Depends on your application, right? It depends on your traffic flow. But being able to understand kind of what the impact is is, is important because then you can start to apply that to your specific needs and your application's needs and decide whether that's a good thing or bad thing and how you're going to address it. Yeah, and if you're using GSLBs, you know, to where you have people on the East Coast where their connections are fine and you're just only degrading the West Coast. So, you know, there's a scenario as well where, you know, you can have where some of your traffic is still being completed. You just have one region still being affected. So what does this look like in Grafana? Oh, sorry, fam. So we can see that now we're no longer spending money, but we can see that, again, our latency in the West is there because that's how topology aware routing is going to send our traffic. We're still at 100% success rate, so we're good. We don't have enough latency to start impacting that, so we're healthy, you know. It's, this has responded well, right? If you were to inject a whole bunch of latency, we would probably see success rates going down in that single zone, and obviously our latency graph would be through the roof, but... You know, we didn't kick this thing too hard. It's, it's, it's performing pretty well. But again, understanding and seeing what's happening is very, very important if you want to manage this thing, you know, long term and have control over, you know, what's going on in your applications and environment. We're going to go ahead and reset our warehouse, make everything healthy again. Yeah, we don't want anything to bleed between these. And to remove topology aware routing is as simple as just, you know, running your uh, kubectl annotate and just deleting the annotation. If you're familiar with that command, just put a minus on the end. And we can check our work. We can see our annotation's gone. And we're going to check events. And we can see that even in events, it tells us that it's now disabled. So one thing you may encounter is a partial failure in a single zone where you could have uh, only half of your application re uh, responding with 500s. Yeah, say you had like a failure in the back end or in middle tier, but your front end is still responding, but half of the responses are 500s going, you know, no, 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 no can't serve this. So this is not really a site outage. This is an application impact. And this is what we also consider an inbound failure condition, right? Or an inbound failure, failure condition, something that topology warrior routing might not pick up. And again, we still have all of our endpoints, all nine endpoints. So what does the status look like? We see in Viz that all of our success, our success rates are going down because it's being spread across all of our regions. Yeah, without connection-based routing, we're going to spread that around. But, you know, the success rate's pretty high. I don't think you're, you know, depending on your application, you might not even notice this if you didn't have observability. But with observability, you can see that things are starting to be impacted and get ahead of the curve on it. Oops. So let's go look see what it looks like in Grafana. So we can see our success rates going down all across all regions, because again, we don't have topology aware routing enabled, and it's being spread across all of them evenly. You can also see the latencies coming back down, right? Because we got rid of that. So it's nice to see recovery from failure conditions as well. So let's go ahead and again, add topology aware routing, simple as adding an annotation. We're gonna go ahead and double check our work. Make sure, you know, I always like to double check. We can see it's there. We can look at our events. We see it's enabled again. Again, we can see all of our endpoints. So what does it look like in Viz? So now we can see our success rates going up in the other regions and it dropping into one. So again, we're containing the issue into one single zone because connection-based routing, right? We're plugged directly in. And, you know, again, you have to decide with your specific application and everything and your environment whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's expecting as we would, you know, or it's behaving as we would expect 
right? It's keeping that in zone, and and you know it's it, it's again up to you whether that's good or bad, but it's very predictable. And what does it look like for Fauna? Can we like go back and have nice little visuals? We can see that everything is going up in the other regions as our success rates, but in the uh, central it's just going down still. So it's, everything is now pinned to that with topology of our routing. Yeah, and you can see, right, it's keeping things in zone since we've turned it on. If we watch this for a little bit, you're going to see that one zone drop to like a 50% success rate. So again, not totally out. We're, we're not, you know, experiencing an outage per se, but we're experiencing an application impact. So let's go ahead and fix our warehouse, get everything back to normal, and remove topology where routing again with a simple annotation of removing it, and check our work. Again, simple grab. It's no longer there. We can see in the vents that it's been disabled, just as we expected. One thing you may encounter is just a complete failure. Something happened where everything's gone. So let's go ahead and just delete our Boston warehouse. We're going to use the big hammer. Just bam, gone. So let's go look at our endpoints. Now we're missing endpoints. We don't. We no longer have our nine endpoints that we are required to have for topology aware routing. Yeah, and this is pretty extreme. We talked earlier about you know wanting to have enough endpoints to spread, you know, to not meet your quorum, right? You want to make sure that if you're going to use this, you spread that load wide enough that if you just lose a few endpoints in the zone, you're going to still have enough endpoints to keep topology aware routing active. We're, you know, we're kind of on the extreme side here, right? Three endpoints per zone is the minimum, and that's what we chose. But we wanted to be able to show failure conditions, you know, clearly in a quick manner because we only have 35 minutes, right? So what's the status? We're going to use, again, Linkerd Viz to be able to view this. And we can see everything's being spread across. Our success rates are still high because things are going to the other workloads. So let's go ahead and restore Boston. Yeah, Came this is a up. little different than the other ones because we want to show you the failure while topology where routing is engaged because if we were just to engage it, it would just pop right back out, right? That wouldn't be any fun. So now we can see everything in uh, Grafana starting to stabilize. We still have our uh, cross AC traffic going on. So let's go ahead and add topology of our routing now. Again, simple annotation. We're going to double check our work, make sure everything's good, which it is. Look at our events. We can see that oh wait. And before we do anything, just remember, right now we haven't hit it with the hammer yet. Topology where routing is engaged. You know, if we let things run a little bit, we're going to see that we're going to keep traffic in zone until we pull out the hammer. Let's go ahead and list our endpoints. Now we have all nine as expected. Let's go ahead and look on Grafana, how that looks. And you can see the red line is going back down to zero. We're keeping traffic in zone. We're avoiding costs. We're avoiding cross AZ latency. Life's good. You know, if we let this run for a second, I think we got a second here. Yeah, we, we do. Seconds, yeah. We can see that that's going to go. And then we're going to pull out our big clown hammer and, and we're going to hit this, this uh, zone in the east here, take out the service. Yeah, so our uh, a boss, Gary, decided to go take a stroll through the uh, data center, and he tripped over a cable, and the whole thing just went down. So, again, <laughs> whole whole data center is down because, you know, someone went through a stroll in our data hall. And so we didn't have enough power leads. <laughs> yeah. Again, now we don't have our nine endpoints. So how did, how did it react to that? So let's look at our events. And this is where Tom was talking about how sometimes in events, it, you know, I think who here is familiar with events and sometimes how it, you know, likes to shove them together where it does it. Anyone experienced that with events? And, and I know people have. Yeah. Yeah. It took a little while, you know, as we're developing this to, to kind of get a feel for, you know, what these things meant. Right. And another important thing that, you know, I cut out because of interest in time is it's important to note what version of Kubernetes you're on because these things are still beta. And they're going to behave differently. And we actually, Flynn in the back hooked us up with the folks who, you know, do topology or routing. And we asked them some questions and said, yeah, you know, it's going to be best to be on the latest because these things get improvements as, as it goes. So make sure you read the documentation and you understand what the status of some of these features are, how to enable them, you know, if you have to do extra, extra steps and, you know, how they're going to react and where to look for things, right? Let's just go ahead and look at our status in Viz again. 
And we can see that right now, everything's working. Let's go ahead and look how it's in Grafana. Did we enable topology aware routing? We did. That should have been, um, should have failed. Did it kick out? It did kick out. So it looks kind of odd. Go back to Grafana, right? So when it kicked out, Linkerd took over, and we're right back at that default state of that two to one traffic. We didn't get the event, but what we're seeing here is exactly what we would see, you know, in a status where, you know, where we wouldn't have topology aware routing enabled. Now we didn't get the event, but we can still measure using observability, and this is why it's important. It's not always going to be clear if this thing kicks out due to endpoints. At some point, it may put an event in there, but in my experience, it's been kind of spotty, right? And no bag, I'm not bagging on it, but this is just one of those realities that I'm sure we all deal with is that it's never cut and dry 100% you know, of the time whether something's working. Having observability, having metrics, and being able to leverage those things is really key to being able to you know, have success with some of these features in Kubernetes. Go back, now let's complete a second one. Let's go back to our slides. Sorry, fam. My laptop decided to go all over the place yep. for me. All right, so all's not lost. You know, what do we observe here? Kind of what's the takeaway, right? We explored like two options. Without topology or routing, we're gonna pay for cross AZ traffic, right? With just default linked or D, it's gonna give us some, some reliability and some redundancy, but we're gonna pay for cross AZ traffic. With topology or routing, it's a just straightforward, easy to deploy way to, you know, do connection-based routing and avoid cross AZ traffic but there are certain types of failures that you have to be aware of and manage and mitigate. And having observability, having metrics, and having these external mechanisms that are aware of things like layer seven you know, routing and, and the conditions that go through there in your uh, in-band failures really is an advantage, right? So you, know, you could end up, if you're not setting up the proper observability and watching what's going on, you could end up worse off than you know, not than just paying for that traffic, right? So, you have to have a lot of design considerations in place, and you need to be able to watch what's going on. So, conclusion, right? Great tool for keeping traffic in zone. It's very straightforward. It's very easy and quick to enable. You know, you could mitigate some of the stuff yourself if you wanted to write, you know, an operator or something that would keep an eye on success rate. So, say you have observability, and you go, all right, if success rate drops below this, I'm just going to turn topology aware routing off for now, send an alert, you know, and then we're gonna go check it out. So there's ways you can mitigate it. It's gonna involve some work on your part. It's gonna involve some maintenance on your part, right? And making sure things are behaving the way you want. Using a service mesh for observability is huge, right? It's a great complement to topology aware routing. And that, you know, failures that are inbound failures or things that don't remove endpoints are not going to kick topology aware routing out. So you need to deal with that yourself and you need to be able to watch things. So the shameless plugs, we have a product that we run internally. It's Boy and Enterprise for Linkerd. It's OSS, the great stuff that you love in there. It's got some additional things. You know, we've got zero trust security, global traffic management. We can watch all this layer seven stuff that we care about. We do some hardening, and we've got some advanced uh, zone-aware load balancing in there as well that uh, is request-based you know, versus connection-based. You can go check it out. You, know, you could stop by the booth, check, talk to us, you know, and uh, we'd love to answer questions you know, about some of this stuff. It's, it's our passion. We got some sessions coming up. We are this one on Thursday at 11, but we've got three more sessions coming up. Please go check these guys out. They are fantastic speakers. They are much more experienced than we are. They're not up here sweating their <laughs> themselves to death, wondering, you know, what's gonna happen. And we didn't have that many failures, so you lost your bets. <laughs> Meet us at the kiosk, come by, check it out, get some goods and uh, have a conversation with us. You know, we'd love to talk about Linkerd, talk about your apps and how we can make your life better. We got some cool t-shirts like ones Tom's wearing, you know, with Linky and uh, Ferris on there, which is the mascots for Linkerd and then Ferris is the one for Rust. If you're not familiar with Rust, it's the proxy, it's a quick. Yep. We're a Rust-based Rust micro proxy, security fast, light footprint. And thank you, thank thanks you. for coming out. We appreciate it, I mean. You guys are the folks that, you know, keep us doing what we do every day and you know, enduring the suffering. Any questions?
If you have a question, feel free to step up, step up to one of the microphones. We'd love to answer it. Everyone's going to go get their lunch. That's yeah. where everyone's going. I, I'm assuming it's lunchtime. <laughs> There's no dumb questions. What do you use for the demo that uh, I took? Um, it was called Demo Magic, but we have a better one that we use called Demosh, and it can be found on our GitHub page. Okay. You can and talk to Flynn about it. This is the master of it. Uh, so the question was, what do we use for our, our demo, our CLI demo? Yeah, he, uh, he made me very sad by showing me that. He almost yelled at me. It was user error with my Python. Python, so, yeah. Python problem. Yeah. <laughs> And it's a lot more powerful too. It's much better. This one was a little barbaric. Yeah. Uh, demo magic is you write shell scripts and it gives you commands and say things like, oh, I can type this and I execute it. Demosh is you have a markdown file mm -hmm. and it executes things in bash block that you can't say in your Okay, okay. So you, these markdown files become the executable for the demo. Yeah. yeah, and that was our goal was to be able to lift this stuff right out of our readme and whatnot. It's just, yeah. you know, the, the, the timeline for getting it working and, and fixing Python took a back seat, right? Demos are hard, but we wanted to do it live. But come in, and there's a lot of commands. I can't remember all those. Oh, yeah. 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 Check it out. Yeah. It's, it made it, this actually work, so it, I wasn't so nervous. If I was going <laughs> to up here and watch everyone like mistype cube cuddle commands all day, I would have been really judged. So. <laughs> no. Nope. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank yes, you. thank you. That is not, but um, if, if you go check out Boyan.io, that's us, on uh, GitHub, and you look in the repositories, there's all kinds of cool stuff out there. We've got a Service Mesh Academy that we do every month that Flynn and I tend to host, and there's, a, uh, there's some great resources in Service Mesh Academy. Some of my repositories that this is based on are out there. We've got yeah. some different playgrounds. If you look for, search for playground, you'll probably see my stuff. Pardon me, the readmes tend to be 80% complete, but the automation works and it allows you to get hands-on using K3D clusters on your local machine. Yeah, and that is, uh, that's my personal one, but I've got some stuff out there too. You're welcome to root around there if you want, but Buoyant IO. Yeah, yes. yeah it, it's gonna keep, yeah. So in our case, right, we had the minimum number of endpoints, all it took as one endpoint, but that was really about, you know, being able to trigger it reliably and quickly in 35 minutes. But that's why I said spread it wider, have more endpoints, you know, if you have to make your services a little, or your, end, your, your actual instances a little bit smaller, but spread it wider, it's going to prevent, like if you just lose a couple endpoints here and there, you're not gonna kick out. And again, depending on your app, you might want to, right? If you've got some app that it's important, like if I lose one endpoint, the, the world ends, then you probably wanna do that. But it's all about design. And in, the other thing that, you know, if you read the documentation, they'll tell you what the weaknesses are. They're very honest about it. And one is that, you know, you, you tend to want to have very stable and well-distributed traffic. If, if you, things fluctuate, if you want to put this thing together with horizontal pod auto-scaling, and again, not to beat up on anybody, you can get some interesting results because things will change and you can get where the two things are interacting and it's a little bit crazy. It's request-based routing, right? So we're looking at each request and we're making the optimal decision based on that request. So we can react in real time and that's why. And again, to, topology aware routing, you know, works great. It's very simple. It's just, you, you, won't, you know, using observability with it makes it more reliable. 